So welcome everyone to our first grand rounds of the year after the department addressed last week. And so I'm gonna start, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jay Schuyler. Um, and so Dr. Schuyler is currently a professor, a longtime faculty member and a professor of medicine, pediatrics and psychology in the division of endocrinology, diabetes and metabolism here at the University of Miami Leonard School of Medicine. He completed his undergraduate at Penn State Medical School at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, and then went on to complete internal medicine residency and subsequently endocrinology fellowship at Duke University Medical Center. There he served in several capacities as a faculty member while concurrently serving as a clinical investigator with the NIH um, and guest lecturer at GW University Medical Center. He accomplished all of these until he joined faculty at University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, where he's remained for almost 40 years. Since joining the University of Miami, he served in many leadership positions, both locally and regionally, including uh, the Chief of Endocrinology and Metabolism Section in the Department of Medicine and the Director of the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism in 2000 to 2004. For 22 years, he was the study chairman for the NIH Diabetes Prevention Trial for Type 1 Diabetes and its successor, Diabe uh, Type 1 Diabetes Trial Net, an international network conducting clinical trials uh, for Type 1 Diabetes. He is the Deputy Director for Clinical Research and Academic Programs at, Diabetes, at the Diabetes Research Institute here. He's also an adjunct professor of pediatrics at Barbara Davis Center of Childhood Diabetes at the University of Colorado, Denver. Um, the accolades go on and on. He is currently the chair of the strategic of the strategy advisory group for the IMNODIA, a European consortium of academic and industry groups that are developing innovative approaches towards understanding and arresting type 1 diabetes. He is the president of the American Diabetes Association and the vice president of the International Diabetes Federation and the founding editor in chief of Diabetes Care the Clinical Research Journal of American Diabetes Association. He has received numerous awards, numerous grants, and is well recognized within the field. It is an honor to welcome our first Grand Rounds presenter of the year, Dr. Jay Schuyler, who will be discussing diabetes outcome trials. Thank you, Dr. Rubu. And uh, let me put my screen up. It's interesting, you, you mentioned everything I did, which in most of my career has been about type 1 diabetes, but the diabetes outcome trials that I'm going to be talking about today mostly cover, they do exclusively cover drugs that are used in type 2 diabetes, so uh, a little bit different. Uh, but they have been the thing that has really changed the course of the way we think about type 2 diabetes. And so um, uh, I'd like to go over those. Um, these are my disclosures, um, which I always put up before all talks. There's a lot of companies that I consult with, but uh, as uh, Dr. Ubo mentioned, I also uh, chair the strategic advisory board of the European Enodia Consortium, and I'm on the board of directors of both Applied Therapeutics and Dexcom. Now, the purpose of these diabetes outcome trials as they were originally devised and, and, and mandated by the FDA in 2008, was to demonstrate safety of diabetes drugs. That's because the uh, thiazoldine diones um, um, uh, which were troglitazone, um, uh, pro, uh, pioglitazone, Pio. what, pioglitazone and um, um, oh, yes, res, res, yes. Um, they uh, they had questioned their safety as to whether or not they were causing cardiovascular mortality. So the FDA mandated that all new drugs had to demonstrate safety, particularly for cardiovascular events. And the typical trial design was that patients were screened. They were then randomized into either the active drug, which was under study, or placebo, or in one case, an active comparator, with both arms receiving glucose-lowering therapy as per the standard of care. The first um, drugs to report out were the DPP-4 inhibitors, um, 
and um, they're very commonly used on the market and sell probably at this at this time somewhere around 10 billion dollars a year of drug sold in the United States uh, which is a huge amount but you will notice here the first one to report was with saxagliptin, the Saver Timmy 53 study. Timmy is a study group based at the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, in, in Boston and Harvard Medical School. And they conducted uh, this study for um, the, uh, the sponsor, who in this case was AstraZeneca. And you'll notice that the, uh, that the hazard ratio was 1.00 meaning that the frequency of events, these were the first cardiovascular event for the composite endpoint. And that was either um, uh, non-fatal myocardial infarction, non-fatal stroke, or cardiovascular death. And you'll notice the event rates were absolutely virtually identical for placebo and for saxagliptin. And the hazard ratio was unity, 1.00, and the 95% confidence interval spanning that. Um, they were non-inferior, was not worse, uh, and there um, the hazard ratio was, uh, the p-value was 0.99 for superiority. It just never came close because they were identical. But it was the first study to, to report out and um, uh, attracted a lot of attention because it did prove there was no cardiovascular risk. And we know these drugs have little or no side effects. When we look at all of them that have been done, with the um, uh, with various DPP-4 inhibitors, allagliptin, saxagliptin, cytagliptin, and linagliptin, and these were all um, um, have, have various um, names of the studies. The cardiologists love to give uh, names to all their clinical trials. Examine Saver, Timmy, Ticos, Carmelina, and Carolina. Um, Carolina was an interesting one because it compared not with placebo, but with the only active uh, comparator, or glimip glimipiride. But you'll notice the, the sample sizes were between 5,300 and, and 16,000. Um, and a significant proportion of them were enrolled with patients who had established cardiovascular disease. In fact, in both the allagliptin study and the cytogliptin study, all of them had had a previous cardiovascular event. But you'll notice they all had similar uh, hazard ratios for MACE, uh, major adverse cardiovascular events that I just uh, mentioned. And they were all just about 1.00 or close to that 0 0.99, 0 0.98, 1 1.02. So there was no de demonstration of benefit, but no demonstration of risk. On the other hand, the hazard ratio for, for heart failure was increased and statistically significant in the Saver Timmy study, increased but not statistically significant in the Carolina study and the um, Allagliptin uh, examine study. Uh, and, and although this has been disputed a little bit and argued about, it's something that, that remains potentially limiting and, and does appear in the label of the drugs at the moment. Let's go on to SGLTs. Um, uh, these are sodium glucose. Uh, transporters, and there have been many drugs that have been, many studies that have been done with these drugs. Card in terms of the cardiovascular outcome trials, uh, empagliflozin had the empareg outcome study, canagliflozin, the CANVAS program, which really was two studies rolled into one, dapagliflozin study, uh, was studied by the TIMI group again, declared TIMI 58, ertagliflozin used, had the Vertes CV study, and those were ones that I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, as I summarize um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the outcomes of all of these. There were also studies conducted in people who had heart failure or who had renal disease looking for further outcomes, and we'll get to those uh, shortly. I'll mention the renal outcome ones now because I won't get back to them very much. One was Credence with canagliflozin, DAPA CKD with dapagliflozin, and SCORED with sodagliflozin. Sodagliflozin is not on the market anywhere in the world at the moment, uh, but it is an, um, instead of an SGLT2 uh, inhibitor, it's an SGLT1 inhibitor primarily, uh, but it does have action on SGLT2 as well. But um, uh, you'll see that uh, its trials have been similar in outcome to the, to the other ones. Let's look at an example. This is the first of the, um, of the SGLT studies that reported out. It's the EMPA-REG outcome study reported at the European Diabetes Meetings in, in Stockholm, Sweden in 2015. Interestingly, 
The European diabetes meetings are in Stockholm next week, this year too. Um, and the hazard ratio you can see is 0.86 and was statistically significant, that means that empical flows and reduced the combined cardiovascular outcome measures, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or cardiovascular death, by 14%. And you can see that started, uh, the curves began to separate almost immediately. And so there was a, an early and continuing benefit from empical flows and did not increase over time very much, but, but um, was seen early on um, and reached statistical significance uh, out at 48 months and uh, overall follow-up. And um, uh, that's when it was reported out. These, these studies are all event-driven. So when you reach enough events that are defined ahead of time between the two groups, you then look to see whether or not they're occurring the same in the placebo and the, and the active drug or whether there is a difference. So this is um, a summary of the, um, of the SGLT2s one major cardiovascular events in, in four studies, five studies, the EMPA reg outcome study, the canvas, in, which was with empical flows and canvas and credence were both with canical flows and credence was enrolled because of renal disease. Um, and so you'll see it actually has a higher overall event rate because people with renal disease have a greater risk. And Virtus with ertigal flows and uh, is down here. Declare Timmy was with uh, dapagliflozin. You'll notice that um, um, the canvas and EMPA reg outcome meet statistical significance and both have about a 14% risk reduction, a little bit greater in credence. The others don't quite make statistical significance on their own. In fact, Virtus comes out basically um, at unity. Uh, but the pooled estimate shows a 10% overall risk reduction in cardiovascular events. If we look for this divided up by whether or not they already had a cardiovascular event at baseline or they didn't, they just were at high risk, you'll notice the ones who did not have cardiovascular events at baseline, the overall event rates are much lower than they are in the group with car cardiovascular events that preceded it. And um, that meant that during the course of the study, they would have need to have more and more events in order to, to, to get to be a, an event rate high enough to see a difference. That was seen with credence because they entered with kidney disease at the outset, even though they didn't have a previous cardiovascular event. But you'll notice that um, the, uh, the others with cardiovascular events look very similar to the overall group, but with in, in Canvas and Declare Timmy, the ones who didn't have previous cardiovascular events did not make statistical significance. So these, the, therefore the label of these generally says they should be used to prevent subsequent cardiovascular events in those who've previously had one. Here's cardiovascular mortality. It was dramatically reduced in the Emperor uh, Glifosin study, 38% risk reduction, the hazard ratio is 0.62. Uh, but the others did not make statistical significance. But overall, it still did, driven in that by the directional changes um, in, in, in these but, uh, and by the emperor reg outcome, but, uh, but not, um, not all of them meeting it. If we look at hospitalization for heart failure, though, that was dramatically reduced in all of the studies and we'll talk more about heart failure momentarily, such that there was a 32% reduction in, in the risk of hospitalization for heart failure, which is really rather prof profound and a very important reason for wanting to use SGLT2s. Here's renal endpoints. Uh, and except for Virtus, you can see that, uh, that they were significant as well in all cases. And this results again in a dramatic 38% risk reduction. Uh, as you can see here in the, in the meta-analysis. Let's turn to the, tri the trials that were conducted for heart failure per se. These were people who were entered with heart failure. There was DAPA-HF and DELIVER, both with dapagliflozin. DAPA-HF and those with reduced ejection fraction at the time of enrollment. The liver, which was just presented three weeks ago at the European um, um, cardiology meetings, uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and emperor reduced and emperor preserved was empagliflozin in reduced and preserved e ejection fraction, uh, and soloist uh, with heart failure was sodagliflozin in people who were enrolled uh, at the time of heart failure. 
if we look at those, this is a meta-analysis which went online August 23rd, the day they were presented at the um, European cardiology meetings just a few days, few, well, three weeks ago or so. And you can see that um, um, here is, is unity that the, this is the effect on cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure. They're all pretty much the same right here, sitting at around a 33% uh, risk reduction or hazard ratio of 0.77. And the combined estimate is obviously highly statistically significant. The number needed to treat is only 25 uh, to, present, to prevent uh, one cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure. Really rather dramatic effects on heart failure. Um, of those five studies. Here are those for heart failure hospitalization that was not reported in, um, in SolarList uh, separately, uh, but you can see again, it's a 41% it's a, um, overall risk reduction, um, uh, excuse me, 31% overall risk reduction. Hazard ratio is 0 0.6, uh, point, uh, well, no, that was ever reduced. Point, it's 0 0.72, 30, um, yeah, 28% overall risk reduction in heart failure hospitalization. Um, and here in cardiovascular death, it's a 23% risk reduction, not all of them reaching statistical significance by themselves, but collectively they're making it. DAPA with DAPA heart failure with reduced ejection fraction made it by itself uh, with uh, a 28% uh, uh, risk reduction. And here you can see on all cause mortality, again, DAPA HF uh, did see that within the study, uh, and they just barely make statistical significance, the upper confidence interval being 0.99 with an 8% risk reduction with the group as a whole. What about GLP-1 receptor agonists? Uh, these have been around uh, for a longer period of time now, for about 17 years on the market, and a lot of cardiovascular outcome trials have been done with those. The Elixa study with lixizenatide is, a, is an outlier, and I'll talk about that separately momentarily and point out why it's an outlier. And that's actually, I'll tell you now, it's because these enrolled people who were discharged from the hospital from having an acute coronary event. So they already had a cardiovascular event, but it was an acute cardiovascular event, and their likelihood of having another event over the next year or two becomes quite high. And therefore, they have lots of events to achieve. They were able to, to enroll the study with a smaller number and get done faster, but they didn't find any difference between the two groups. All of the others, I will show you differences between the groups. Leader with liraglutide was the first to report. Sustained six with semaglutide injectable. Um, XL with exenatide once weekly. Harmony with albaglutide, a drug which is no longer on the market, interestingly, even though um, you'll see some that it had remarkably good beneficial effects, but it had zero market share essentially. And so the manufacturer withdrew it from the market, but still supported finishing the Harmony study and allowed the investigators that was, they, they were, it was led by a group, uh, by the Duke Clinical Research Group and by Oxford. Uh, they allowed them to finish the study, uh, even though uh, they had withdrawn the drug from the market. Rewind with dulaglutide, Pioneer 6 with oral semaglutide, and uh, Amplitude O with F peglenotide, a drug which never made it to the market. Um, it was thought to be not commercially viable, even though I'll show you it had great beneficial effects. And, and so uh, it's, it's interesting how these, uh, these things can be driven in terms of their final outcomes by what happens in the marketplace as much as by what happens in the trials. So here's a meta-analysis for MACE again, and you'll see Alexa, was unity, but those were the people who were enrolled with uh, acute coronary events. But if we look at all the others, uh, Pioneer 6 is, you can see, is a smaller total contribution. It was a smaller study. It was done uh, with oral semaglutide to try to confirm the, uh, the sustained 6 with um, injected um, um, uh, semaglutide, but uh, you know, because it was smaller, it didn't quite reach statistical significance by itself, but was in the right direction. And here's Amplitude O and Harmony. They both achieve nice statistical significance, although neither one of them is on the market. And the group as a whole shows a 14% risk reduction. The hazard ratio is 0.86. So they have a significant beneficial effect on cardiovascular events. 
Again, if we look whether they have a history of CBD previously or not, when you look at those who just have risk factors, they don't quite make it. Their event rates are, are much lower overall. Uh, and you can see none of them made it. Uh, and here, although there is a, a variation in the, amongst those that have a history of cardiovascular disease, uh, again, this looks very similar to the total group uh, when you see it before 16% risk reduction. Uh, what about cardiovascular mortality? Shown in the leader study um, by itself, shown in Pioneer 6, interestingly, and the others all trending in that direction with the exception of Elix uh, and interestingly sustained 6, but overall 13% risk reduction for cardiovascular mortality. Here's non-fatal stroke. Statistically significant by itself, only in rewind with dual glutide, but overall, again, a 16% risk reduction. Non-fatal MI, uh, only Harmony, the drug that's not on the market, albaglutide, showed statistically significance within the study. And overall, they just barely miss making it for non-fatal MI. It's a 9% point estimate of a risk reduction, 0.91 hazard uh, ratio, but you'll notice that the upper confidence uh, limit goes above one, so it's not statistically significant. Heart failure, uh, may, uh, you can see here the um, 0.90, 10% risk reduction, less than what you see with the SGLTs, but moving in the same direction, although the only one to achieve it within the study was Amplitude O, which had a dramatic reduction. And that's F -fed, uh, feglinotide, not on the market, interestingly. Renal endpoints, several uh, 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 make it on their own, leader, sustained six, and rewind. And in fact, sustained six has a study going on now called FLOW to look at it in patients who are enrolled because of renal disease. Um, but as a group, there's a 17% risk reduction uh, that um, is significant in that the upper confidence limit is less than 1.0. So it, they do have impact on renal outcomes as well. If we look specifically at macroalbuminuria, which uh, was included as part of the, uh, uh, the overall outcomes, but uh, didn't, not, not, in the, not, not done in the combined renal outcome, which had to be doubling of serocreatinine, um, um, end-stage renal disease or death from renal disease, um, what you see here is that the group as a whole for macroalbuminuria, the appearance of that in people who didn't have it at entry is, is significant in virtually all the studies and it's a 26% um, uh, risk reduction. So looks like pro progress of renal disease is uh, impacted by GLP-1s. There is a combined GLP-1 GIP uh, now on the market, terzepatide, um, its cardiovascular outcome study is underway, but this analysis, which was done in Nature Medicine earlier this year uh, by Dr. Sitar from Glasgow and his colleagues, pulled uh, the um, terzepatide groups in, in a number of studies that were done with the comparator that they were with, and they mostly had active comparators, although a couple had placebo. Um, and what one sees is that overall, the hazard ratio is 0.80, uh, but it doesn't have enough total events to reach statistical significance to sit. The p-value is 0.183 and the upper confidence uh, when the uh, limit scans uh, spans on the upper side of 1.0, so fails to reach statistical significance. But the ongoing trial uh, is much larger and designed for cardiovascular outcomes and hopefully will reach statistical significance. We will have to wait and see. There's also a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, which is on the market, uh, finerenone. And two studies were done, uh, Fidelio and Figaro. And Fidelity was a sort of uh, mini meta-analysis that combined the two studies for cardiovascular outcomes. And you can see the composite cardiovascular outcome was statistically significant, uh, as was uh, hospitalization for heart failure. Um, and then the others, cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke by themselves did not make it, but the group as a whole uh, did, driven in part by hospitalization for heart failure. 
But uh, finerenone does reduce uh, cardiovascular events in the composite outcome as well. And if we look at the renal events, this is the EGFR uh, of 57%, um, which is basically doubling of serum creatinine, uh, and, uh, or kidney failure, or end-stage kidney disease, or an EGFR of less than, um, than 15, um, or the 57% uh, decrease in EGFR from baseline, you can see all of those reach statistical significance. Renal death is only two patients and four patients, so uh, we don't show the, uh, uh, the overall um, uh, summary of, of, of things there. But you can see, again, this is another one that shows benefit. So what we can conclude and what our takeaway messages are is that these outcome tri trials were initiated to show safety and they've done so. None of them has shown cardiovascular risk. And the SGLT inhibitors, the GLP-1 receptor agonists and finerenone have all shown remarkable cardiovascular heart failure and renal benefits. And so therefore these outcome trials have been a valuable addition to our knowledge base and should really dictate how our treatment goes about. It's surprising to me that the largest selling drugs on the market are still the DPP-4 inhibitors, which although they have no side effects, have not been shown to have any beneficial effects other than a minimal lowering of A1C and no adverse effects. And my, buy, my, my big question now is that we've completed multiple studies. How, how do we modify these trials ethically in order to maintain equipoise? You want to be able to no longer go against placebo. You want to be able to go up against active comparators that have been shown benefit. And I think that's really going to be the difficulty uh, going forward in trying to figure out the, the outcome designs. For example, I just showed you that I mentioned terzepatide, and it has an ongoing cardiovascular outcome trial. There, it's comparing it to um, uh, dual glutide, um, a one of the drugs in the GLP-1 class that's been shown to have benefit. And now the, the question is, will terzepatide be able to be at least equal to that or presumably exceed that um, since it has uh, a lot of other benefits as well, but we're gonna have to wait and see. So uh, it really does complicate uh, trial design going forward, but, Thank you. That's um, what I'll say. And I'll turn it back to Dr. Weiss to take over for Q&A. Dr. Schuyler, that was just an exemplary presentation, up to date, uh, really provocative and thought provoking. And thank you so much. I, we are short, a little bit short on time because we have another presenter, but I, I must ask you this question. What is the, so what's the corollary here to blood glucose control? with all these agents. So we get the cardiovascular improvement. Is this a separate, I understand it's analyzed separately from the hemoglobin A1C control, but is there some uh, some way in which we can sort of put all of this together for the clinician in terms of, yeah, this is gonna benefit your glucose and this is also gonna benefit your cardiovascular mor morbidities? Well, the, the, the greatest glucose lowering occurs with the GLP-1s and they have substantial beneficial effect here. Uh, there's minimal effects actually on, with some of the SGLT2s on glucose lowering. It, I, you know, it's interesting. Your, your old friend and mine, George Backris from the University of Chicago has said that the SGLT2 inhibitors are fantastic drugs for preventing heart failure and kidney disease, which as a side effect, have a little bit of lowering of glucose. And... Uh, they really don't have it much impact on glucose, yet they've had these profound impacts on these other outcomes. And the trials have been designed to try to keep, uh, keep glucose levels equal in the placebo groups and the treated groups by, by the other things that are being used. So I, I think that the effects are, are most likely independent of glucose lowering. Um, and you know some of it may be contributed to by weight reduction from the GLP-1s, uh, receptor agonists. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think they ought to be, my bias is that they ought to be the primary drug we use to treat type two diabetes. Um, and, uh, but I have to say, I, I, I am biased. The first two to, to uh, the first 
drug of the class to get on the market in the first months weekly. I was on the board of directors at the time we developed those of the company that did that. So I have a bias. So maybe you have to take that into account. But but I do I have I do believe they should be the first choice drug for treatment of, of diabetes because they have glucose lowering, they have weight reduction, and they have cardiovascular benefit. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much. We'll now move on, Dr. Ubu, to our next pre presenter. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Schuyler. And so our next presenter is Dr. Aslam Pala. And so Dr. Pala is an assistant professor of, um, in the Department of Rheumatology here at University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Pala attended medical school in Turkey and completed her internship and residency in internal medicine in my hometown, Englewood, New Jersey, through ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She completed rheumatology fellowship at Albany Medical Center. She worked in private practice in Albany prior to joining the faculty of the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine in 2010, where she's now an assistant professor of clinical medicine. She has multiple publications, specifically looking at rheumatoid arthritis and the effects of treatment on fatigue, as well as the impact of smoking and alcohol on the progression of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, she has won multiple awards, including uh, the American College of Rheumatology MSK Ultrasound Train the Trainer Program Award, um, the RAF Abbott Medical Student Preceptorship Award, as well as the Doximity Telemedicine Fellowship. With all of these awards and accomplishments, Dr. Paula continues to be involved in the community through the White Tulip Health Foundation, a nonprofit that advocates for immigrant and international medical graduates, as well as Turkish Americans. It is our honor to welcome Dr. Oslin Paula, who will be talking to us this afternoon about updates on rheumatoid arthritis. Welcome, Dr. Paula. Good afternoon, um, everyone. And Dr. Ubu, thank you for the introduction. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. All right, well, again, thank you uh, for having me today. Uh, I am going to talk about um, income prevention. So my disclosures, uh, I'm gonna discuss some of the table use of uh, medications and then uh, some studies only available in abstract form from the last year ACR meeting, and I have no financial uh, disclosures. And again, offline is that uh, RA prevention is going to be one of the main focus of my talk. And then I'm going to briefly talk about Jack in the first aid here. So I'll start with the case presentation. Um, so, you know, current paradigm in rheumatoid arthritis management uh, is illustrated well uh, in, this, in this case. So we have a 25-year-old female with progressively worsening of joint pain, stiffness, and swelling for about a year. And she has visited primary care for several times, recently noted to have swelling in her MCPs. So her rheumatoid factor is negative, CRP not normal, and the ACFA CCP testing was not done initially. So since this was not done initially, referral to rheumatology was delayed, but finally she was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and methotrexate started about 15 months after onset of symptoms that seem attributable to rheumatoid arthritis. So, it is really incredible to import the, incredibly important to know how to help this um, patient, really. So how do we improve access to rheumatology, improve treatments? Are they certainly worth preventing? It's a very uh, serious condition. It's a forever disease once you have it. And unfortunately, about 50% of patients uh, don't respond well to our existing uh, treatments. And now, I'm going to briefly touch through this uh, paradigm, the emerging paradigm in rheumatoid arthritis, that now another case uh, here uh, presented here, 35-year-old woman who feels fine. Her mother has rheumatoid arthritis. So because of her mom has rheumatoid arthritis, she's asking, will she get RA? If yes, what can we do to prevent it? So her examination is normal, uh, and ultrasound of the joints are normal as well. So biomarker testing shows she has positive CCP antibody and then RF-IgM were also uh, elevated. So now in this slide, uh, I am going to go over the overview of RA development. 
So now we have this um, new emerging concept, pure rheumatoid arthritis, and it may be defined as a state that is high risk for future RA, but no synovitis is detectable yet. So antibodies plus minus symptoms. So on the left far end, you can see genetic risk is there, and then uh, environmental risk factors may come into play. And the next stage, we start seeing some systemic in autoimmunity. And in this stage, patients might be complaining arthralgia. And then there is a there is a term um, that was um, suggested by uh, Ular, clinically suspect arthralgia CSA might be happening around this time. So we have the you know genetic risk, environmental risk factors. Some people develop systemic autoimmunity, and then next they go on to develop unclassified arthritis. So there might be some asymmetrical joint involvement in this stage. And then the next stage for some patients, so, so some people would be rheumatoid arthritis with persistent arthritis. So this is where we now um, <clears throat> define as pure rheumatoid arthritis, where we have the start of systemic autoimmunity and some symptoms, some non-specific symptoms like arthralgia. So prediction uh, in case control studies, if we have RF and ACFA positivity, that could actually have more than 80% positive predictive value for future uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And if we have both ACFA uh, and RF, uh, that is usually more than 90%. And if you have positive CCP antibody, more than 20% risk for articular RA within the next three to five years, and it's even higher uh, over five years. <clears throat> and in this uh, slide, um, I again go over the, the, the concept. There is a survey to RA where uh, we actually, at the bottom of the uh, stair, we see some break intolerance, cellular femoral, and there could be some ACFA development. And then expansion in autoimmunity, uh, we can see some other um, antibodies production. And this is where our uh, second case, the 35-year-old female who feels fine might be falling into. Then as you can see on the left hand, we have the genes and environmental factors and some mucosal processes actually are playing the role. And in the next stage, we have uh, expansion of autoimmunity to now the, the tissue targets, the joints, uh, and in the other organs. And early synovial inflammation can be seen in the next stage in immune complexes, cells, neutrophils. The very uh, top um, of the stair, we now have the rheumatoid arthritis, more persistent. And that is our 35 year old patient who had uh, symptoms for over a year and now has uh, more obvious uh, signs of rheumatoid arthritis. And in this stage, as you can see, rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic autoimmune disease, so we could actually see some cardiovascular involvement and you know, lung involvement, increased cardiovascular disease specifically. So uh, we definitely came a long way. Uh, since uh, 1930s, all we had was non steroidal anti-inflammatories and gold salts. And then in 1950s, we started to see glucocorticoids, right? This was a remarkable uh, development. Uh, most patients were controlled, but they have just way too many side effects. And then moving uh, forward, we have uh, late 1980s, the methotrexate, our main drug for rheumatoid arthritis came to the picture, then 10 years later, leptinomide. And then late 1990s, we start seeing our first biologics, starting with atenarcept and fliximab, followed by other anti-TNF agents, abetacept, then the D-cell agent, rituximab, pesluzumab in 2010, and then 2012, we start seeing our first JAK inhibitor. So we certainly made a lot of progress managing rheumatoid arthritis in, in recent years. <clears throat> However, the question is how successful are we treating RA and can we even prevent it? So uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, the joint damaging rheumatoid arthritis can be actually completely avoided with immediate therapy. So early diagnosis and early treatment is, is very, very important. And if you actually uh, apply the treat to target principles, uh, which is very strict control of uh, inflammation, then yes, that's a very successful outcome. However, um, 
in reality, only maximum of 50% patients actually achieve complete remission. And then once uh, we have like seropositive patients and chronic disease, it's nearly impossible to really discontinue medications and remission or cure is, is very possible without medication. So certainly there is a high demand for new therapeutic uh, principles and even different approaches in managing rheumatoid arthritis. So you my recommendations for definition of disease stages and biomarker studies. Um, again, this is the concept I earlier introduced to you. On the left hand, you see the genetic risk, then um, environmental risk factors like smoking comes to play, systemic autoimmunity develops. There is some role of mucosal biology. We actually have like, like more understanding now that there is some gut dysbiosis and um, there's a lot going on in the mucosal uh, biology. And then we start seeing systemic autoimmunity. Uh, there is a lot of systemic immune dysregulation. We start seeing RF, ACPA, then again, arthralgia, unclassified arthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis. <clears throat> so we have some trials that are targeting uh, those different stages uh, to see if we can actually prevent rheumatoid arthritis before it starts. So obviously we can't do anything uh, to the genetic risk, right? That's there. Environmental risk factors, probably those could be modified. Well, for example, you know, patients should be, um, you know, should not be smoking. So that's a modifiable uh, risk factor that we know of. And then when we start seeing systemic autoimmunity and atrogia, those trials that I'm going to go into details, like prairie, staparay, staparay, apipra, and treat earlier, trials are trying to target those patients in this stage to see actually if we can delay uh, you know, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, development of rheumatoid arthritis, or even prevent it. <clears throat> so this study was published in 2019. The prayer study actually uh, was to look at the effect of B-cell directed therapies on the preclinical stages of rheumatoid arthritis. So they had made one ind individual CSP treatment, and they were followed a uh, mean of three to nine months. So those individuals had arthralgia, so they had some joint pain, but they had no synovitis, and they had ACPA and RF and CRP elevation. So that was the inclusion criteria. So 30 patients out of 81, like 37% of individuals, develop arthritis over a mean of three nine months. So those patients were given rituximab 1,000 milligram times one and methotrexamine, so 100 milligram IV times one. So at the end of 12 months, actually, uh, this regimen caused a delay in arthritis development um, compared to placebo treatment at the point when 25% of subjects had developed arthritis. So this was something uh, positive um, that we see in rheumatoid arthritis uh, prevention. And the next trial was STEPRA trial that was published last year, actually. And uh, this uh, study was a very small study. It was a randomized controlled trial. It was prematurely stopped due to a variety of reasons. Um, they were not able to recruit a lot of patients, 62 patients only. They had a median follow up 14 months. Uh, RF, RF plus ACFA or ACFA were greater than three times of the upper limit and arthralgia. Uh, and atorvastatin actually was given for the year. And uh, are you able to hear me? Because I think my screen is okay. I my video, my camera stopped working. Atorvastatin 40 milligram uh, a year, and no protective effect uh, was actually seen in the study. But again, this was a, a short study, prematurely stopped, and then, um, you know, very small study. So the next uh, trial was treat earlier trial. Uh, so this publication actually came uh, this summer in July 2021 in the Lancet. So they had uh, 216 individuals. They had clinically suspected arthralgia and MRI detected subclinical joint inflammation. Those individuals received single intramuscular group for injection, 120 milligram, and one year course of oral methotrexate up to 25 milligram uh, per week, or placebo. 
And in this study, methotrexate did not prevent the development of clinical arthritis, but modified the disease course as shown by some improvement on the MRI detected inflammation and related symptoms and impairments compared with placebo. And the next study is the RIA study that gained some attention uh, at, the, uh, at the annual meeting, uh, ACR uh, meeting last year. This was a study on abetacept. And patients, they had about 100 patients, 49 uh, in, the, in, in the treatment arm and 49 in the, in the placebo arm. So they were assigned to receive abetacept uh, for six months. And they had a baseline MRI then at six months, 12 months, and 18 months. So they were followed for up to 18 months with no treatment. And in the, uh, at the end, what they have seen is actually abetacept is superior to placebo in improving subclinical inflammation in RA uh, at risk patients. Those individuals were also ACFA positive. They had MRI findings though, and they had arthrology, but no detectable synovitis on exam. And uh, there were no new safety issues with the, with the other set. And we have a few ongoing RA prevention trials. We have stop RA, uh, ACFA positive patients more than two times, asymptomatic individuals. So they have no symptoms whatsoever, but they have positive antibodies and hydroxychloroquine for a year. Um, they're, they're given. So this is uh, still an ongoing trial that's being done in, in the States. And the second trial is a PIPRA trial. That's actually, again, ACFA positive patients, clinically suspected arthrologists. Those individuals have some bone symptoms. Even a better step for a year uh, and they're uh, being followed. This is done at UK. So now uh, with all those prevention trials, uh, what, what do we do really? Obviously, uh, they're still being studied. We don't really, um, you know, we don't apply those uh, in, in clinical practice. But this was an interesting uh, study published by Dr. Thomas's group in New, uh, New Zealand, actually, uh, in Internal Medicine Journal. And based on some evidence, they provided some practical tips for clinicians uh, to, to discuss with our patients. So the title of the article was Rheumatoid Arthritis is a Preventable Disease, 11 Ways to Reduce Your Patient's Risk. So they even created a template for the uh, educational material for the patients uh, to, to review. So simply, they recommend uh, patients to stop smoking, reduce their occupational exposure, like silica exposure, maintain healthy weight, maximize dietary quality, increase leisure time, physical activity, and sleep quality, maintain good dental hygiene, and support mother's breastfeeding, and check on your face vitamin D. So those are all good recommendations for patients for a variety of reasons anyway. So uh, while we're still seeing progress in the field on the prevention uh, of rheumatoid arthritis, very reasonable to advise all our patients really. So now I'm going to uh, briefly talk about some safety concerns that uh, came uh, last year. As you can see in the slide, September of last year, 2021, FDA actually made an announcement uh, that requires warnings about increased risk of serious heart-related events, cancer, blood clots, and death uh, for the James Kine inhibitor. So this uh, actually was a result of oral surveillance study. That was mandated by FDA when they have seen some initial uh, concerning findings uh, from the early, early studies. So this was a randomized open-label non-inferior to phase 3D4 safety endpoint trial, and patients were random, randomly assigned to uh, in one-on-one -on -one and one ratio to receive either open-label oral ifacitinib at a dose of 5 mg or 10 mg twice daily, or subcutaneous TNF inhibitor. That was adalimumab in the States and a tetracept uh, 50 mg once weekly in the rest of the world. And only patients who were older than 50 years of age were uh, actually uh, included in this study. And they had to have at least one uh, additional cardiovascular risk and active disease despite of uh, being on methotrexate. First patient was enrolled in March uh, 2014 and ended uh, in 2020. So when they did the interim analysis in 2019, they actually see increased mortality and high risk of PE in the high dosage arm, which was then terminated. And those patients were actually shifted to lower dose for their remaining scheduled treatment. 
And as a result of this uh, oral surveillance study, FDA actually extrapolated the study's finding to all JAK inhibitors and restricted use of this class of drugs to patients with RA only after TNF inhibitor failure. So this was a very important um, development in our, in our field. And earlier this year, actually in January, this major publication came at the New England Journal of Medicine, and this discusses cardiovascular and cancer risk with propositinib in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And as you can uh, see in this figure on the top uh, A, actually figure A, uh, in the combined propositinib group, which is five and 10 milligram, there was an increased HAZA ratio with 1.33 um, uh, versus uh, TNF inhibitor. So this was for uh, death from CD causes, non-fatal myocardial infection, infarction, and non-fatal stroke, and this was significant. So incidence of MACE were higher with the combined propositinib group at 3.4%, as you can see here in this group, uh, that is 98 patients in the propositinib group versus 37 patients with 2.5% in the TNF group. So number needed to harm was calculated and uh, this was uh, 567. And in other words, actually 113 patients would need to be treated with propositinib rather than would a TNF inhibitor to result in one additional maze. And for the increased risk of cancer, again, in the combined tofacitinib group, hazard ratio was 1.48, and that was significant. And then in figure B, you see the incidence rates for the cancers. And in the combined tofacitinib group, uh, it was 4.2% with 122 patients developing cancer versus 2.9%, and that is 42 patients uh, in the TNF group. And again, they calculated a uh, number needed to harm, and uh, 55 patients would need to be treated with propositinib rather than with the TNF inhibitor to result in one additional cancer. And most recently, last month, uh, another publication uh, came um, on the infections in patients with rheumatoid arthritis receiving propositinib versus TNF inhibitor. And in this study, on the left side, in the figure A, uh, we have the overall risk of infection, and then we have the age between 50 and 65, and older patients, 65. So the green um, field circle actually represents 5 milligram dose for the tofacitinib, and then the blue one is the higher dose, 10 milligram, and then the triangle is the TNF inhibitor. So as you can see, overall risk and um, in eight people aged between 50 and 65 and older people, a higher dose of propositinib actually had a higher risk and overall actually both uh, five milligram and 10 milligram dose had a higher risk of uh, infection. And if you look at the, the, the next figure, actually this is all infections excluding herpes zoster and the same results, uh, we actually see higher risk of uh, infection uh, when it's um, excluding herpes zoster. So the HAZA ratio uh, was 1.17 uh, in the five milligram um, dose, and then it was 1.48 in the 10 milligram dose. And in this study, they were able to identify some risk factors for serious infectious events, like increasing age, baseline of your use, history of chronic lung disease, and uh, time dependent on corticosteroid use. And for the non serious infectious events, being female, uh, having history of chronic lung disease, uh, past smoking, and time dependent higher deaths in kidney age joints and high kidney death protein were actually risk factors for risk of infection. So, this is uh, helpful in clinical practice to identify patients who are at risk. Uh, and then we also had a registered data on the propositinib uh, safety because this was a randomized uh, controlled trial. However, real world evidence, uh, once the medication is approved, also uh, is quite valuable. So this is the largest registry in the in the states, um, and 
patients after they compare patients taking initiated uh, initiating tetracycline uh, versus all biologic DMARs. So it wasn't just the TNF inhibitors. And they actually seen similar incidence of maze and serious infectious events, malignancies, and death uh, over five years. So this was certainly different from the oral sur surveillance results. And then uh, similar to the oral surveillance uh, study, purpose also incidence was higher in the tetracyclinamide uh, group uh, versus biologic DMARs. The incidence of venous stromal events were similar. So uh, this was another uh, significant finding to uh, help us in the clinical practice. So now uh, we are left with some questions after uh, after the oral surveillance study, and there are some take-home messages. So can we really um, apply those results to all uh, JPNFs, or those are only specific? Those results are specific to participants. So we don't really know yet because they do have some variations in the mechanism of action. So in the future, hopefully we'll see more data on the other JAK inhibitors. And then also can we generalize results to all patients with RA? Since this trial actually included patients with active disease older than 50 years old and patients with at least one to years factor. So this is another question that remains unanswered. And then we have to keep in mind that RA patients actually are already at a higher risk for mace and cancers than uh, persons in the general population. And um, another important finding was really maize and cancer risk were higher in age of, you know, in people aged uh, more than 65 and then in smokers. And this highlights again importance of CV screening, cardiovascular screening in rheumatoid arthritis patients and also smoking cessation. So, in summary, um, future clinically apparent synovitis can be predicted uh, based on some of the um, studies that I presented, like having ACPA positivity or rheumatoid uh, factor positivity. And we have to monitor at risk patients carefully. And we are seeing some possible paradigm shift in RA management to intend to prevent. So lifestyle interventions are really important in RA patients. So we certainly made significant progress uh, treating rheumatoid arthritis. Our medications work effectively, but uh, but still 50% of patients are not uh, doing well. So safety concerns are there, as uh, we just discussed with prevention, early diagnosis and treatment are really critical. So this concludes my presentation and if you take any questions. Thank, thank you, Dr. Paolo. We appreciate that beautiful presentation. Um, I remind, we don't have time for questions. So I ask people to write to Dr. Paolo independently. Please note the chat in order to link to the CME uh, credits uh, for the end of the lecture. Thank you everybody for participating today and look forward to seeing you next week. Everyone have a great and safe day. Thank you.